Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this um, seminar in the War Crimes Research Group seminar series. Um, today, we are joined by um, two of the authors of a new book on human shields, a history of people in the line of fire. Um, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Rachel Coe. I'm Professor of War and Society in the Department of War Studies and also co convened the War Crimes Research Group. Um, so it's really great to welcome you today and to welcome our speakers um, to this uh, to this seminar as well and say thank you very much for joining us and, and talking about your book. Um, in the series, those of you who've been um, coming along to the series so far will know um, a bit about it. We've got a couple more um, coming up this term. I just flag up next week's event, which is on the Kosovo Specialist Chambers. Um, and that's next Monday, um, 29th of March, um, I think at one o'clock as well. So do sign up for that too. But for today, I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers um, who are going to talk to us about their excellent new book on human shields, a history of people in the line of fire. Um, so we have Professor Neve Gordon, Dr. Nicola Perugini and Dushyanti Pillai. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about each of them. I know that you'll be able to access their bios on the, um, you will have read them on the um, announcement for the event today. Um, but Neve Gordon is a professor in the School of Law at Queen Mary, University, um, Queen Mary University of London, and his work focuses on international humanitarian law, human rights, ethics of violence, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I'm also joined by Dr Nicola Perugini, who is a senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Edinburgh. So Nicola's research focuses mainly on international law, human rights and violence as well. And he's the author with Neve Gordon of The Human Right to Dominate um, and obviously of Human Shields, A History of the People in the Line of Fire. He's been a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and a Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow at Brown University and also a Marie Curie Fellow. And his current research project is exploring the global history of the University of Edinburgh and its entanglement in imperialism in the Middle East. And I was also very interested to see that you're working on humanitarianism's visual cultures. So I don't know if you'll have a chance to get any of that into the talk today. Really interesting. And finally, we have um, Dushyanti Pillai, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of War Studies and a member of the War Crimes Research Group. Um, so Dushy is going to offer some discussant comments on the book once Nicola has, has presented about it. Dushy holds an MA in Human Rights from UCL. And before coming to King's to embark on a PhD, she had worked for over 20 years um, in international development in Asia and Africa um, in post-conflict settings. So she brings considerable practitioner experience to our discussion. So the way we're gonna proceed is uh, uh, Dr. Perugini is going to speak first for about 20, 25 minutes, I think, um, about the book. And then we'll hear from Dushi with some discussant comments and then from Professor Gordon as well. And then we'll open up to Q&A. So please do put your questions in the um, Q&A box as we go, if you'd like to, or um, there'll be an opportunity at the end to ask your question um, verbally as well. So stick your hand up at the end if you do want to ask a question, so two ways of doing that. So I'm gonna hand over now to Dr. Perugini, um, who I think is gonna pull up a PowerPoint to present. Um, yes. So thank you very much, over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Are you able to see the PowerPoint just to make sure that yes. we're on the same page? Great. So thank, thank you, you. Uh, Dushi and uh, Rachel for the very kind invitation and thank, um, I would like also to thank the other participants to this event for taking the time to be with us. So since I have 20 minutes, uh, let me go straight to the core of the book and let me provide uh, a definition of human shields. What are human shields? Human shields are both uh, human uh, and uh, weapon, and this duality, this uh, weaponization of humanity, this transformation of the human body into a weapon is what makes uh, human shields ethically, legally, and politically problematic, disturbing, but also extremely uh, fascinating to investigate and uh, think through. Uh, Human shields are civilians or other people who the law uh, protects, like uh, prisoners of war, who are either forced or volunteered to shield a legitimate military target in order to deter, to deter the enemy from attacking it. So human shields, in a broad sense, are uh, human weapons of uh, deterrence 
um, the 1949 uh, Geneva Conventions and the 1977 Additional Protocols were key moments in the process of legal codification of human shields. The 1977 Additional Protocol uh, 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 defines human shields in the following way. Uh, as you can see from the slide, the presence of mo or movement of the civilian population or individual civilians shall not be used to render certain points or areas immune from military operations, in particular in attempts to shield military objectives from attacks or to shield, favor or impede military operations." End quote. So, Many things can be said about this definition and we can discuss it further, but I will limit myself to uh, one crucial issue. The law here operates through an avowal and disavowal of the protected status of the people who become human shields. It avows the protected status of human shields by rendering uh, it illegal to use civilians or prisoners of war as shields, but it also disavows their, their protected status by asserting that human shields will not render an area immune from attack, uh, thus suggesting that uh, human shields can be killed. Uh, in other words, uh, while outlawing the use of human shields, the law allows, in certain circumstances, to kill them. Uh, this paradox is what generates a series of legal, ethical and political dilemmas, some of which I hope to discuss today with you. I will limit myself to context of international armed conflict, then we might expand to other contexts of human shielding in the Q and A. Um, the book begins with the American Civil War, in which we trace the first debates about the ethical implications of the use of prisoners of war as human shields. In the following decades, human shields were discussed in relation to also the Franco-German War, where some of the greatest legal minds of the day argued that tying French dignitaries to trains was legal because it was a state practice in reaction to attacks against the trains carried out by non state irregulars. These debates of the end of the 19th century have a lot to do with railways and trains, since trains are used to transport troops, ammunitions and provisions. Trains are attacked by guerrillas and insurgents and in turn used by state armies to shield. So enemy civilians and prisoners of war were taken for shielding tours on trains, like in the second Anglo-Boer War, of which you can see an image in your slide. The context of the Anglo-Boer War was that of an imperial war, but an unusual one. It was an imperial setting, but the fighting parties were white. Consequently, the rules of engagement and the implementation of the laws of armed conflict, which in other colonial wars were deemed inapplicable because the enemies were non whites were regarded as pertinent and were closely scrutinized by the British press and debated in the House of Commons. So the Boers attacked trains transporting British troops and systematically captured soldiers and civilians, including Winston Churchill, who at the time was a war correspondent. So the Boers caused significant losses to the Imperial troops. The Royal Forces responded by adopting a series of new counterinsurgency measures among them, the use of human shields. This triggered a heated debate within the UK Parliament and among journalists, legal experts and humanitarians, some of whom denounced the practice of using human shields as inhumane. British liberals were outraged, but not because they rejected imperial violence, which they thought was at times a necessary tool for extending universal uh, uh, humanity across the empire, their criticism against their government of using Boer settlers as human shields was that the violence was directed at whites, thus revealing the racial underpinnings of their conception of humanity. Human shielding uh, would have probably passed unnoticed if, instead of the Boers, the people used as shields had been uh, black. Just to illustrate this point a little bit further on the relationship between race and human shields, uh, 15 years later, the British Empire used Palestinians as human shields in mandatory Palestine, but in this case, the human shields were not 
white boars, there were brown Arabs, and there was neither scrutiny by the British press nor debates at the House of Commons. Uh, four decades after the Franco-German War, uh, human shields were once again deployed on European soil, this time during the First World War. In August 2014, Germany invaded Belgium and was faced with armed partisan resistance. In response, the German troops did not hesitate to bomb densely populated areas, burn houses and villages, execute civilian hostages and use human shields. Across the English Channel, the British government used testimonies about German atrocities to galvanize public support for entering the war. A series of governmental reports were produced by Belgium and the UK, which focused extensively on the inhumane warfare methods adopted by the Germans. The figure of the human shield became a key lens through which these governments debated the use of violence, advanced their legal and ethical arguments, and forged a distinction between civilized and uncivilized violence. For Britain, for Britain these reports about German barbarism also constituted a tool for justifying its military intervention in the First World War. Um, so let's move to another context. When two decades later, in uh, 1936, it, Italy invaded Ethiopia, the fascist regime did not hesitate to bomb quite systematically the medical facilities of the International Committee of the Red Cross. The Ethiopian government denounced the Italian bombardment as inhumane and as a violation of the legal prohibition to target medical facilities. In response, the Italians claimed that the Ethiopians were duplicitous, using field hospitals marked by the emblem to shield combatants and military supplies. Therefore, they argued, bombing the hospitals was leg legitimate reprisal for the enemy's illegal use of the emblem to shield legitimate military targets. Thus, it was during the Italo-Ethiopian War that the accusation of illegal human shielding was extended from human beings to medical facilities. So let's move to another context of war that can help us to understand the political implications of the mobilization of the human shield in the uh, international arena. Let's move to the Vietnam War, which took place 15 years after the first codification of the legal figure of the human shield in the Geneva Conventions. So in Vietnam, the Viet Cong followed Mao Zedong's teachings and organized a people's war in which civilians and combatants worked together as a people in order to liberate themselves from colonialism and imperialism. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Mao Zedong's doctrine of people's war, according to which the revolutionary forces and the guerrilla forces have to blend with the people, with the civilian population, in order to win the people's war against imperialism. Infiltrating the social body, the Viet Cong promoted cooperation between soldiers and civilians, and in this way involved the masses in the anti-imperial war effort. The Viet Cong understood that their forces' success depended on the guerrillas' capacity to work together with the people, and so they also intermingled with the rural population like a fish in the water, to use a famous Maoist expression that I'm sure you are familiar with. That doctrine was embraced by many anti-colonial movements around the world and transformed the, inter the international political order, leading formerly colonized societies to the creation of new independent states and expanding the family of nations and expanding also the idea of humanity, we could say. During the war, the U.S. administration and the media attempted to flatten the complex notion of Mao's People's War, where, for example, the civilian population participates in the war effort by feeding the fighters, caring for the wounded and sick, providing the fighters with intelligence, by casting the civilian population as hostages in the hands of the Viet Cong. So it, what happened here is that a complex political doctrine like the People's War 
was reduced to an act of human shielding, to an act of perfidy and inhumanity carried out by the communist enemies who were accused of not understanding the ethics of war and of deliberately putting their civilians at risk by using them to screen legitimate military targets. Um, I need to, I need a sip of herbal tea. So, um, the legal figure of the human shield was mobilized also uh, after Vietnam. In Bosnia, at the beginning of the 1990s, Milosevic's forces captured UN troops and chained them to military installations and depots. This prevented NATO forces from bombing this military site. It was the first time that the United Nations personnel was used as a weapon of deterrence in a war. Serbian commanders were later condemned for the use of United Nations human shields by the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia. Few years later, in Kosovo, unlike in Bosnia, NATO forces bombed areas protected by Serbian forces through the deployment of human shields. This time, the shields were not valuable UN personnel, but rather Kosovo refugees, and NATO forces killed scores of civilian refugees in the village of Korisha as a result of its bombardments. Under NATO political pressure, the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia suspended its investigation on the killing of these Kosovo human shields. As you know, uh, humanitarian wars are portrayed as clean wars, and an investigation for war crimes against NATO's humanitarian warriors for the killing of refugees would have made the idea of humanitarian war as a clean war less tenable. Uh, let's now move to the post 9-11 context in which the figure of the human shield has become even more prominent, and we can discuss this, why after 9-11 this is more prominent uh, during the Q&A. Um, so during its recent wars on Gaza, uh, the Israeli military repeatedly disseminated on its social media and official websites um, uh, a series of infographics legitimizing its killing of civilians by using the human shielding argument. As you can see from the slide I, that I'm projecting on your screens, Israel's argument was straightforward. Since Palestinian armed resistance groups, in particular Hamas, deployed civilians as human shields, placing them in front of legitimate military targets, Israel is not responsible for civilian casualties. We realized that this line of reasoning was common in other theaters of political violence uh, uh, of the last couple of decades. The civil war in Sri Lanka, the military campaign against the so-called Islamic State in Iraq, the wars in Yemen and Syria, the war in Afghanistan, the human shield has become a sort of legal political epitome of the so-called war on terror declared by George Bush after 9-11, one of its most invoked legal figures by different political regimes of different political colors and driven by different and often opposing political agendas. So Russia, Iran, Israel, Saudi Arabia, just to mention a few of them. That element that political transversality across ideologically different state actors of the accusation which has allowed to legitimize the massive use of lethal violence against so many civilian populations was worth to be investigated and this is what made us feel that our project was somehow urgent. So we started asking ourselves uh, who are human shields who are those civilians uh, the example of the war on isis or more precisely the war on daesh in iraq is particularly illuminating people may recall that mosul uh, in iraq was captured by isis in 2014 and then recaptured by the us-backed iraqi military in 2000 
and 16. In 2016, everyone from President Trump to, to Amnesty International blamed ISIS for using human shields. And ultimately, the United Nations came out with a press release accusing the extreme Islamist group for forcing 100,000 Iraqi civilians to become human shields. Even though evidence of ISIS brutal use of human shields is overwhelming, the suggestion that a few hundred militants deployed ten of thousands of Iraqis as shields appears to be a blatant exaggeration. We initially thought that most of those la labeled as shields by the United Nations were categorized in this way due to their proximity to the fighting. The fact that the city's inhabitants remained in Mosul when the fighting commenced, namely they did uh, not actively flee, was enough to brand them as potential weapons, thereby stripping them of some of the protections international humanitarian law provides uh, civilians with. We realized that civilians trapped in areas where non-state actors are fighting are the ones categorized as human shields. We called these kinds of shields, which constitute the majority of those who are framed as shields in contemporary wars, proximate shields. Proximate due to their proximity to irregulars, to non-state armed groups. By contrast, those caught in similar circumstances but surrounded by a state's military are not categorized as human shields and do not lose the protections offered to them by international law. People become proximate shields only when they are trapped near non-state fighters. So, for instance, to go back to uh, the context discussed in my previous uh, slide, Israeli citizens in Tel Aviv are not classified as shields when Hamas launches rockets towards the Israeli Defense Forces Military Command headquarters located in the city center. By sharp contrast, Palestinian civilians are cast as human shields when Israel launches its rockets towards uh, Hamas command centers and military infrastructures in the Gaza Strip. In other words, if Hamas kills Israeli civilians, it is to blame for killing innocent lives, and if Israel kills Palestinian civilians, then Hamas is also to blame, since according to the existing logic, it is Hamas that has deployed these civilians as human shields. So I, I could continue with many other examples, but I think it's uh, I, I can stop uh, here on some of the crucial questions of our book. So the question of the identity of the actors in the battlefield. So who is the humane and inhumane actor? Are those who are framed as human shields? The question of uh, who is shielding and in proximity to which kind of military targets, so state or non-state targets, and ultimately the question of how human shielding based on these questions allows to legitimize and or delegitimize the use of lethal violence against civilians in contemporary uh, wars. So uh, thank you for your attention and looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much. It's absolutely fascinating. And as you say, you know, you've raised some really big questions there, I think, that I hope that we'll be able to get into in discussion around identity, legitimacy, responsibility and the sort of shifting sands of that depending on you know, how, how they identify um, issues around kind of um, agency and duress um, that, are, that are really 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 significant and, and really interesting. I'm going to go over to Tushi now um, to um, give us your sort of commentary and, and response to the to the book. Um, and then we'll hand over, then we'll go back to, to Neve um, and then open up for questions. So as I said before, please do put your questions in the Q&A um, or be prepared to pop your hand up um, if you want to ask your question um, in person. So Dushi, 
over to you. Thanks, Rachel, and uh, many thanks, Nicola, for that really interesting presentation on the book. I know it the book is very multi-dimensional and multi-layered in terms of how it looks at Human Shield, and it's a lot to try and fit into a 25 minutes. Um, I think my I've, I've read the book, and I think what I found really interesting was that um, how human shields are deployed in different settings. And what was really interesting is how human shields are created, not just by how they are used, but also how they are framed through the discourse and who they are and who is using them as shield, but it's also who is kind of attacking the human shield as well. And, the, and then the definition seems to shift around that, which I thought was really um, quite worrying, particularly since more and more of the conflicts do tend to happen in urban environments and therefore um, as you said there's this sort of discourse of human shield is being mobilized by um, the more powerful state actors um, to exonerate themselves um, so i think one of the things that i thought was quite worrying is that the threshold for proving that civilians are actually being used as human shield is quite low especially if proximity then becomes um, you know, enough to classify people as human shields. And so the ability of state actors to frame people in the vicinity of conflict as human shields, even retrospectively or even before the fighting begins, seems to kind of set things up in their favor. Uh, I thought maybe I could use um, the Sri Lankan um, sort of chapter in your book to kind of look at this a bit more closely. So we know, according to the UN estimates, up to 40,000 people have died in the last few months of the Sri Lankan conflict. And we know that LTT had prevented civilians from leaving the no-fire zone where they were killed when the government was bombing um, that area quite indiscriminately. Um, and then later, the government framed LTT as uh, using human shields and it's their fault for resulting deaths. And as you said, it's it's usually the, the sort of non-state actor who, who, who becomes responsible for the deaths in, in this kind of context. But I guess just kind of kind of looking behind that a bit more, we know that LTT usually, um, you know, historically have always kept the people they've sort of had in their territory from leaving, uh, partly as a way of showing they got legitimate support from the communities that they are allegedly fighting for. So it's not surprising that in the last few months they did the same thing and prevented um, the civilians from from leaving. So I was just wondering, um, you know, if if we kind of look at the people who were held under LTT as not as human shields, but perhaps as hostages or as prisoners of war, or if there is some other framing, how does that, you know, how does that play out in the idea of human shields? Um, so I was just kind of thinking about that. And the second one was something that you touched on early on, which is uh, perhaps that looking at the international humanitarian law through a decolonizing lens, how this law seems to be mobilized particularly by um, colonial group, you know, countries such as US, UK to justify potentially a high debt toll when they, um, attack, you know, work in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, which results in um, sort of drone attacks leading to high level of casualties, but then they kind of reframe it as human shield and how it seems to be the most vulnerable people who seems to be perhaps disproportionately affected by, by this sort of argument. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just stop there and get some comments on that. Thank you very much, Lishi. Um, before I ask Neve, um, so if you could respond and give us a few comments, I wonder if I can just add a quick little question to that and sort of use my position, which is, it, you know, the question I had as you were starting out is why, why did you choose the US Civil War? Why did you choose the time frame that you chose to, to, to look at? Is it to do with the sort of um, thinking about it in the context of the development of international humanitarian law? Or did you look further back and are there examples that you might have wanted to draw on um, more historically um, to that? So um, Neve, if I could ask you to come in and then I can see that some questions coming in the chat, which is great. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. So let me begin with your question, Rachel, and then go to Dushi, and then maybe Nicola can add a, a few things on what I say, if that's okay. So basically our decision to begin with the Civil War uh, had to do with a few issues. First of all, it was a civil war in the sense that it was the same, it was people from the same country fighting each other. 
and therefore they recognized each other as humans, which is very important because in colonial wars, you don't, you, the, the imperial or the colonial militaries often consider their enemies as subhumans. And so you, the, the assumption of human shield is that the other is human. You have to be a human shield in order to be, you have to be human in order to be a human shield. So in a sense, our book is also, and I think Nicola intimated this, our book is also a history of, of the human. The history of human shields is also a history of who is considered human because uh, uh, humanity, we know, is not a biological uh, fact, but it is actually a political construction of who belongs and who is ex excluded from humanity. So the, one of the reasons is we, 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 we took a civil war is that both sides recognized each other as human. But I think the most important reason has to do with the Lieber Code. Uh, the Lieber Code uh, 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 was published uh, in, in the midst of the war in, in 1863, and it later became in many ways a blueprint for international law, for the Hague Conventions, uh, and so forth. So the legal debates about human shields and the, all, the, all the arguments in the codification begin there, at that moment. At that mo that is the moment that human shields becomes a topic of discussion and not only use. So you're absolutely right that you can go back in history and find many instances of the use of human shields uh, prior to the American Civil War, but they were not a flashpoint of discussion previously. Regarding the 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 yeah. Your comments, Dushi, thank you very much for them first. Uh, yes, in, in the mainstream uh, commentators about human shields uh, always look at, at and understand human shields as the weapon of, of the weak against high-tech states, right? They don't have the high-tech that these state militaries have, and therefore they use human shields as their uh, kind of weapon of last resort, while we turn this on its head and show, yes, maybe sometimes that's the case, but most often, and particularly as Nicola said, after the war on terror was launched, human shields has actually become the weapon of the strong, a weapon of framing the civilians that it had killed in order to blame its enemies for their deaths. So, so it, it's, it, whether it's a weapon of the weak or weapon of the strong is very important in how you understand and how you frame the events that you're looking at. As to the Tamil uh, Tigers and the, the Sri Lankan war, I, we think the, the, we found what happened in Sri Lanka as fascinating for many, many reasons. One of them, which uh, you didn't mention, but I think is important to mention, is how human rights lawyers, prominent human rights lawyers, prominent humanitarian lawyers are hired by the state to defend its war crimes in the sense, and, and we see people that are considered like major human rights practitioners and lawyers out there defending the most horrendous war crimes where, as you say, maybe 40,000 civilians were killed in a number of months. And, and, and what is fascinating is to read their affidavits and to look at the acrobats that they use and how Human Shield become the major figure to defend the, the Sri Lankan state uh, from war crimes. What, what you're asking is if we can understand what happened in the, in the, in the safe zones, the so-called safe zones that became the killing fields of Sri Lanka, whether we can understand them as hostages or prisoners of war. Uh, 
Um, I don't think so for a number of reasons. One is, first of all, they were not understood as hostages or prisoners of war by anyone. The whole discourse around it, both on all sides, had to do with human shields. And that's important. We have to take that discourse seriously. Um, but what, what, and then there are, or at least according to the human rights reports, there were incidents of Tamil Tiger uh, uh, militants that uh, either threatened or fired toward uh, civilians that tried to leave the, the, the safe zones. And yet, towards in those months, by the, by the end of the conflict, again, we have a few hundred militants, we have 330,000 people in these safe zones. A few hundred militants cannot keep these people hostages, cannot keep them as prisoners of war. It, 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 it becomes a kind of use, as a, use of an exception in order to suggest that there was a rule there. There was no rule there. I'll only add, and then I'll, I'll allow, we can maybe turn to other questions, is that there are three kinds of human shields. One is the, the human shield that someone grabs and uses in front of them in order to shield them or to check if, it, if, if something is booby-trapped. It's the coercive use of to 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 uh, during the the first and second gulf wars and a lot of people in greenpeace that use it not in wars but in environmental struggles where they put their body on the line in order to protect something behind them voluntarily now in these two kinds of shields there's agency involved in the first one the coercive is the person that's holding them as shield in the second one it's the volunteer that 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 volunteers to be a human shield and the shielding the act of shielding exists so long as the agency is in at play what is interesting about the proximate shield is that no agency is really involved so we we look in the book at the location of agency and the fact that no agency is involved, that it's only due to their proximity to irregulars, to non-state militaries, means that they are human shields for as long as the fighting happens, as many of them can be called human shields. So it changes the spatiality of human shields, the temporality of the human shields, and the numeric amount of people that can be framed as being used as human shields. And that is, uh, and, and then you can justify the killing of masses amount of civilians through the human shields argument. So I'm gonna stop there on this, and maybe Nicola, do you wanna add something or should we go? Very, very, very briefly, yeah. Uh, uh, Rachel's question was also a methodological question, right? Uh, uh, so we started asking ourselves, where, when is the origins? And that question about the origins was very tricky. So basically for us, human shielding is, becomes human shielding as we conceive it in the moment in which there is an ethical and, and, and legal uh, uh, contentiousness, right? And, and that's what we witness immediately after the, the civil war when the Libra Code also uh, is, is adopted in, in Europe, you know, as a lens to understand also European wars. So that's the kind, the kind of key moment of this uh, ethical and legal debates. Uh, one final very brief comment to Dushi's uh, uh, response. Uh, sometimes the language of hostages is used but it's always complementary to a point in which they, they remain crucial. So it's sometimes prisoners of, of war are there, but the, the key category, they are, these categories are uh, constantly and systematically subsumed under the category of, of shields. And that, that's what happened in, 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 in Sri Lanka, but in many other contexts. Great, thank you. Thank you for answering those. And thank you for the, I mean, setting out that typology, Neve, I think is really, really helpful in thinking about 
in sort of teasing out what what it is that we're looking at here and these questions of agency and then you know how they relate also to responsibility and justifications um i've got some questions in the q a so um the first question is from um gabriel honrada um and i can see that you've put another question in as well so i'm going to just ask both of your questions together um, concept of human shields apply to information warfare does the concept extend to non-physical domains of warfare i.e cognitive social information domains and if so then how do actors engaged in disinformation and influence operations to use human shields in the context of information warfare and then Gabriel's just followed that up as well um, by asking perhaps by controlling the information domain actors can use human shields to protect themselves from criticism, provide scapegoats for their own failures in case of governments, and maintain a semblance of legitimacy and mass support. Um, so I don't know who wants to take that one and come in. Maybe I'll, I'll begin and then Nicola will Thank add, you. is that okay? Uh, so, I mean, what we see, what, what we did when we began writing uh, the book, uh, around 2014-15, we did a Google alert for human shields. So every time human shields is mentioned in a news article, we, we, we get uh, the daily alert. So first we saw there was this kind of exponential growth during this period. But then we noticed that in many, in some, not many, but in some of these cases, human shields was used as a metaphor for, for different uh, like uh, a boss that puts the blame on uh, his or her uh, assistant and uses the assistant as a human shield in order not to get blamed for something. And, and if I understand the question correctly, I'm not sure, and maybe uh, uh, um, um, Gabrielle, who, uh, Gabrielle will can correct me if not. It seems to me what you're talking about is an act of perfidy in the sense of putting, if may, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, maybe you can intervene, uh, where I kind of impersonate someone or something during an information war in order to get data or in order to, I don't know, enter into new domains that I'm not allowed to, to enter. And in that sense, I'm not sure I would, if that is indeed what you mean, I'm not sure it is, then I'm not sure I would call it human shields. Because the problem is that we lose a certain kind of a, uh, analytic ability when a concept becomes too wide for use. It, it, its explanatory power, I think, is reduced. So we need to kind of maintain, but maybe that's not what you mean. Do you want to intervene, Gabriel? Gabriel, if you want to... Um, if you want to clarify, if you just put your hand up, then we can put the the spotlight on you, if you like, and we can hear you. Oh, great, yes, wonderful, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, uh, so every, everything's clear now. So um, <clears throat> what I was thinking was, um, how does the concept of information, uh, or uh, sorry, human shields apply to information warfare or, or in today's climate of disinformation? As uh, I can see, I can somehow relate this to the COVID-19 pandemic and the response of some countries, for example, US under Trump, uh, Brazil under Bolsonaro, or the Philippines under Duterte, in the sense that civilians, normal citizens, take the brunt of the, take the brunt of the, or are being blamed for the shortcomings of the government, in, are being blamed for uh, the shortcomings of their own governments. In in turn, they become a sort of shield against criticisms for human rights, for example. Um, in the Philippines, the Duterte government keeps on blaming the Filipino people for uh, not observing health protocols, et cetera, et cetera. Even if uh, external actors are bombarding the government with criticisms that, hey, you're not doing your job, something, something of that sort. 
we, we also see the case in Brazil where in, when uh, President Bolsonaro said in uh, some cases, oh, just suck it up. You can cry all day about the losses of, from COVID-19, suck it up. It's in fact using his own population as human shields against what? External criticism from other states that, hey, your policies are inhumane or using his population as a shield from internal figures or the opposition that aims to will uh, usurp power or run for office. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm also drawing on uh, what uh, Ms. Pillai said about maintaining uh, legitimacy. Um, uh, in fact, uh, if you keep bombarding your people with such uh, propaganda by controlling the information domain, you use them as human shields in some way to maintain a semblance of your legitimacy. This is in the information domain because uh, I mean, I'm quite shooting from, from my hip, so to speak, because when I yeah. hear your comments, I'm trying to also connect it with, uh, what is this? China's activities in the maritime domain, using civilian status as a shield for its maritime militia. You can't just shoot maritime militia. They're fishermen, at least in theory, but then they're crewed by PLA auxiliaries. So those are things on the top of my head that I want to answer. And to sum it all up, I do think that can this concept of human shields extend to the information domain? Uh, Thank you. Just, just a quick comment. Yeah, we use the notion of info war, but in, in a slightly different way. So we focus, especially in the last, on the in relation to the last two decades, on the use of social media and new media in order to produce this kind of narrative and this kind of discourse. So this is something we deal with. Uh, just a note, a note of uh, caution. Uh, yeah, it, 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 the control of the media is important, but I think that what we try to do in the book is to try to demonstrate that it's not just about the powerful controlling the media and so influencing how people think violence in war. What was fascinating and what is fascinating is that there are people ready to understand that reading, to buy it and to uh, and to reproduce it. So. Uh, I was always fascinated to find in Curso Malaparte, an Italian novelist, a, a clear description of how Arabs and Muslims are more inclined towards human shielding in a novel of the 1950-something. So there is, there, there is a, a popular readiness also to understand the ethics of violence uh, in that way. And that has to do also with existing and pre-existing to, to the info wars, to the pre-existing conditions under which we understand violence, the meaning of violence along identity lines and uh, uh, along. Understood. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got a question um, about uh, distinction from David Bicknell, which I'll read out. So I think um, part of this has been answered by uh, Neve's comments um, about the sort of different types of shields, but David's asking about the distinction between voluntary and involuntary human shields, which they may then lead to a legal distinction between those who directly participate in hostilities, i.e. the voluntary shield, and those who don't, which may lead to different rules of distinction and proportionality applying. Do you use that distinction? Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit if you do? Um, between the different sorts of human shields and the implications of that for rules of distinction and proportionality. Nicola, I don't know if you want to take that one. Maybe Neve will take the beginning mm -hmm. of the legal question and then I will follow. So, so I made a distinction before about where the, the location of agency between uh, the voluntary and involuntary shield. I'd like to make another distinction. And that is that the involuntary shield is part of the economy of violence of war. It, it, it does not disrupt the economy of violence of war. While the involuntary shield, which uses nonviolence to act against, tries to undermine a certain economy of war. It's it, to prevent war, to prevent violence, something of the sort. Now, the involuntary shield cannot be captured by the laws of war. 
and that that's a very interesting and I think important observation. Nicola showed you before the the definition of what human shields is, and it 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 talks about using civilians. It talks about an external act of agency using civilians. And the reason is that civilians, as they are imagined in the laws of war, are passive. They're, it's a very gendered category. The civilian is feminized and, and considered as a passive. The minute the civilian becomes active in war, it loses some of its protections. And, and the problem is that the the involuntary shield is not really participating in hostilities according to what we think of as hostilities. Hostilities mean, usually we would think of them as meaning some kind of exertion or helping in the exertion of violence. While the voluntary shield is the anti-militarist, non-violent person, okay? So, it is exactly the this figure of the of the voluntary shield that in many ways uh, exposes some of the operations of power within the laws of war and how the laws of war operate. Um, and and what we show in the book, and by this with this I'll end, what we show in the book is how the principle of distinction is used time and again, from the very first moment, from the Civil War, all the way till today, as a distinction between the, the civilized and uncivilized. The civilized is the group or is the actor that uh, protects the, the notion of, of uh, uh, or the principle of, civil, of distinction, while the, the uncivilized is the one that supposedly uh, undermines that distinction. And the what we show is how the principle of distinction is constantly used to, to frame the enemy as barbaric and therefore as the one that is to blame for civilian death. And, and so this whole principle of distinction is problematized the minute you look at it through the lens of human shielding. But Nicola, maybe you want to add? Yeah, just just something in relation to passivity and uh, passive civilian in relation to one of the cases that I was mentioning in my uh, in my presentation, which is Vietnam. Vietnam is a turning point in which what happens is that some civilians uh, participate in the war effort, not as human shields. Uh, they abandon their condition of passivity because there is a foreign occupation and they help the guerrilla and the insurgents to resist uh, a foreign invasion. Uh, now, what we show in the book is that it's, it's quite uh, singular and quite uh, interesting to notice that uh, civilian participation in against foreign military occupations, for instance, in Italy, uh, in France and in many other states were framed as partisan warfare, legitimate partisan warfare uh, that uh, helped those countries to liberate themselves from a foreign military occupation uh, to such an extent that in Italy and France partisan warfare is inscribed within the constitution so it's really legally uh, the, the, the foundation of, of, of a new political order when that very form of activity of participation to the liberation effort is carried out by uh, this anti-colonial movements, then a problem emerges. That partisan warfare is not tolerated anymore and you have the kind of discussions that you have during the decolonization period in which the crux of the matter is precisely this, to which kind of protection are these people who participate in, in the hostilities uh, entitled. So the, the additional protocols provided uh, anti-colonial movements with some protections, but at the same time, certain clauses continued to allow certain states uh, 
to carry out violence against civilians when they're framed as human shields. So that's the kind of conundrum, unresolved conundrum of the additional uh, protocols. Okay, thank you. Um, in our remaining five minutes, we've got a couple of questions which I think I'll put together because they're around the same issue and it's it's quite a, I think, a good question for us to end on some reflection on this. So um, uh, Nadine um, Idiwak asks, how can we prove and hold these governments accountable for using human shields. Um, and then G. Leslie, so I don't know your first name on here, asks um, if you feel present day protections for civilians in time of war are inadequate, does there need to be a rewriting of international law and international protections? And if so, what phrasing would you suggest? What punishments to be used and how enforcement should take place? So both pretty big questions. I wonder if I can just, um, address it first to um, to Dushi to just say something briefly perhaps about the Sri Lankan context and, and accountability and then um, and then back to Neve and then Nicola um, before we round up so Dushi if you want to come in. Yeah thanks Rachel and um, yes I think the the proximate shield as I mentioned before is a really worrying trend where um, I guess it goes to the heart of international humanitarian law in the sense they don't fit in very neatly into the civilian or the belligerent category and therefore they're uh, open to being sort of used in different ways by the usually the powerful state, uh, which can help to then exonerate them and as Neil mentioned. This is an argument that's really been mobilized by the Sri Lankan government using very high profile lawyers to kind of really calculate how much casualty is deemed you know okay in this context so i think yeah the really important question of how do we kind of close this gap in um kind of updating the international humanitarian law to ensure that approximate shielding isn't a convenient way of getting out of very serious crime would be i think really important and i also just want to say thank you both of you for this really really interesting presentation as well uh, thank you, Dushi, for inviting us. Um, yeah, I mean, these are very, very big and important questions, both of them. Um, I think international law is a double-edged sword. And as we see it, the powerful are the ones that interpret it. There is no law before interpretation. It's always subject to interpretation and the powerful are those that interpret it and they can interpret it in a way that uh, advances their objectives and goals. And what uh, Nicola and I, Nicola mentioned in the case of uh, Ethiopia, the bombing of hospitals, and we've written uh, uh, an article for the European Journal of International Law on it and what we show is yes hospitals for example are protected according to international law but the international law has numerous exceptions to the protection and what we see is how the the exception becomes the rule in the justification of bombing and 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 it's major it's not a minor issue because in the past at least from 2016 till 2019, if I remember correctly, those three years, every day and a half a hospital was bombed in the Middle East, every day and a half. And if you look at the responses of the bombing actors, it's always these exceptions. They were hiding, co shielding combatants. They were shielding a, we a weapons depot. They were near, again, shielding the proximity argument. And, and, and so the law works through its exceptions and the exceptions are interpreted by, by the powerful. And, and, and yes, we can, we, we can and we should uh, uh, make corrections to the law, but to think that that will be some kind of panacea, that that will resolve the issue, uh, uh, I, I, I don't believe it, but yet I, I also think that it's important to do so. And I'll end with that. Thank Nicola. you. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, oh, one minute. Yeah, on that, on that question of the hospitals, we tried to make the argument, okay, you want to keep the human shielding clauses, keep them. But since that reveals an unbalance of power in which if 
the attacking party can say, you know, the were the, that hospital was shielding something. So put put try let's try to put also some limitations on the attacking power and let's try to close the gap of the exceptions. Why there is an exception on attacking hospitals and there is no uh, so the, the, there is a question of balance here. We're not saying, okay, human shielding is completely rotten and it's uh, what legitimizes constantly in, uh, 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 the killing of civilians. We're saying, okay, you want to protect civilians in that way, protect them, but let's try to expand the norms which, are, which can prevent the powerful from using some of the exceptions of the law. So we don't know how that article is going to be received and if uh, legal experts will... Uh, agree with our argument. Okay, thank you. Look forward to reading it. It's in the European Journal of International Law. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time and we've been very good at keeping to time. We're bang on two o'clock, so I'm very impressed. Um, I just wanted to, you know, these issues of enforcement um, remind you of all about the event that we've got next week on the 29th of March, um, where Professor Eleni Chatidu is going to talk about the Kosovo Specialist Chambers um, and that um, issues with responsibility in that kind of context. I think what you've both just been saying really points to this sort of <laughs> dilemma between what's necessary and what's sufficient. So obviously the law is necessary and we might need some improvements in the law, but the law can never be sufficient to, to make the changes um, uh, and, and ensure the enforcement. So the, the, the kind of gap there as well, um, which we should think about. This has been such a fascinating discussion. Um, I would urge everybody to go um, look up the book, go and buy yourself a copy and, and read more into it. There's a link to the book on the um, events page, so you can, you can follow that up um, there. And it just really reminds me to say thank you very much to Dushi for organising um, this event, um, which has been great. And, and huge thanks to you, uh, Nicola and Neve for coming along and talking to us um, about this really important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you thanks very much. To you. Dushi, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.